fueled by C4, Cellucor, and Extend. Use the code Clydesdale to get 20% off the checkout at C4Energy.com. On Clydesdale Media, where we bring you the widest array of content here on our YouTube channel. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. Hit that notifier so you first know when new episodes are available. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Clydesdale Media Podcast. My name is Scott Switzer. I'm the Clydesdale. And I am so honored and privileged to have with me three-time, three-time CrossFit Games champion, Casey Acree. What's going on, Casey? Not a lot. How are you, Scott? I'm doing well. Doing well. Um, it's been a couple of weeks since the games. You uh, getting back to working out yet? Yes, I am, actually. Um you know, I, I generally, after competitions, often feel like I need a good amount of time off. Um, but, you know, after this year, for whatever reason, I was still, like, engaged and, and interested in staying fit. I, I usually kind of just will stay away from, like, CrossFit-y type stuff for a couple months or whatever. I'll do some bodybuilding or strength work or, or whatever it might be. But I kind of felt good. Um and so I, I got back into fairly normal training within a couple of weeks. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of just right in the same rhythm that, that I'm normally in. So I saw a thing that Ariel Lowen had put out yesterday where she felt weird about, um, getting back into training and it, because you ramp up for the games, right? The volume goes way up and even though she's back in the gym, it's not what she was doing right before the games. And it just felt weird. Do you go through any of that yourself? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Even, you know, like I said, I, I was back into, I, I took probably like a, a, a week off essentially. Um, you know, we got done on Thursday that following week, I kept it pretty light really. Um, and then I did another week that was like, one session a day of just some fairly basic stuff. And then that, so I guess really like, you know, a couple weeks after the games is whenever I first started kind of getting back into what I would call like a normal schedule, which would be like an AM and afternoon session, um, you know, CrossFit type stuff, strength work, Olympic lifting, aerobic, aerobic stuff. Um, and yeah, I mean, even, even after, you know, a few weeks and, a week of kind of like getting back into the groove you're still you're still in kind of this like i don't know i, I call it like the refractory period where whether it's a, a psychological thing or it's an emotional thing or it's a physical thing um you just feel like you can't quite express things at the same level that you just were three weeks ago and I, you know and honestly it's not that you've really lost any fitness in that time period. You're not, not maybe, maybe a, a marginal amount. Um, I think all it is, is like you've, you've kind of ramped things up so hard, both from the intensity and volume and what you're doing physically, but also kind of like the psychological effect that that has. And, and that just that big emotional experience of the CrossFit games and it's, it's the travel and it's the, the social aspect of it. Um, and then just the, kind of this, this, these days of all kinds of work in such a short amount of time, um, there's just like kind of a letdown I feel like that comes with that. And so a lot of athletes will, will perceive that in just that couple of weeks, they've gotten less fit or whatever it might be. And really what I, what I th kind of think that is, is it's just like your body kind of just needs this calming phase to be able to get things ramped back up, right? You can't just stay at your, at your top level of expression all the time. And when you have this big event, that's this emotional and kind of this adrenaline dump over the course of several days, it can take months potentially to kind of really get back to the same level of expression that you, that you were able to do. And again, that's not necessarily meaning that you're any less fit, it's just that, like your nervous system and your body just won't let you tap into that maximum potential quite yet because it's still needing that time um, mentally and physically to, um, you know, get recovered. So this year at the games, you went eight for eight. 
uh, perfect 800 points, uh, winning the upper extremity, up, upper extremity division of the adaptive division. Yeah. You did that last year as well. And then in 21, you went seven for eight. Yes. So in three years, you've won every event, but one. Do you think more about what you've won or the one that got away? Um, probably the one that got away because I'm blessed to be around a bunch of people that help to keep me humble. And they remind me of that one that got away often. Um, kind of a, a funny story. Uh, my, my gym that I, that I train at and that I own, um, were kind of like connected with a physical therapy clinic. The owner of the clinic uh, was a former um, coach of mine at a previous gym I was at. And so we kind of have a not official business relationship, but we share space, share equipment, et cetera. Um, and every year for the games, he, he gets a banner made for me that he hangs one banner on his side in the clinic. And then we, I hang a banner on my side. Um, and that year, the, the big giant picture that he chose to be like the main picture of the banner was from that event. And he said, he said he intentionally chose that one to remind me um, it, it was, it was a deadlift wonder at max uh, and I took third place. And so he, he said he, he got that picture specifically so that there was something in the gym to remind me of what I needed to be working on over the course of, of the year and, and training in the future, um, which is deadlift. So, yeah, I mean, I, in the grand scheme of things, of course, it's easier to point out the one, right? There's 22 that I've won, and then there's one that I took third on. Um, so it's easier to kind of pinpoint that one and, and think about that. Um, not, not that really I have like any, um, you know, insecurity about that at all. I, I, it was, I was not even within reach of the, of the guys that beat me. Uh, the, the two, it, again, it was a deadlift wonder at max. First place was like 526 pounds. Second place was 500 and then I took third with like 420 or something like that. So um, it's not like it was an execution error or it was something that I could have really like prepared for better. Um, I mean, of course I could be stronger at, at pulling something off the ground, but for whatever reason, it's just not a, a huge strength of mine. I can actually, I can back squat more than I can deadlift, which is not very common. So um, yeah, I mean, I definitely still always, train deadlift probably even more than I used to just, just knowing, um, you know, that, that it's a weakness. It's a, it's a weakness of mine and something that I have to consistently train and work on just to even keep close to, um, you know, my all time wonder at max, which is kind of funny, like all my other lifts within a week or two of like getting back into training. Um, I can get my numbers pretty close to like my all times, um, whereas deadlift, like if I take time off of it, I'll, I'll, I won't even be close. I'll be like 80%. will feel like a, will feel like a wonder at max. So yeah, I think I probably think about that one a little bit more. Well, uh, I'm in that club with you. Uh, my back squat is way higher than my deadlift. Yeah. Uh, and the 12 back procedures probably contributed to that to some, <laughs> some degree. Um, but I was never a strong deadlifter for some reason. I think I have like short arms. And like a long torso, and it just it makes the pull that much further for me on the deadlift, and is just rough. Yep, yep. I'm I'm the same way. I've always said it's anthropometrics. Um, I'm yeah, long torso, short femurs, um, which is great for squatting, but not so great for for pulling. Um, and like I, people always ask me if it, if I think it has something to do with having to hold onto the strap, and it's like it's never a grip limitation. It's just that whenever I hit a certain number on the bar, I try to pick it up and it just won't move. Um, and my, my brother, who's a, a very strong athlete, uh, is very similar build or at least anthropometrics to me. Um, he's the same way. And so that's why I always say that I think it's not so much about the hand or the grip or whatever. It's, it's more so just what my body is kind of predisposed to be good at his his back squat, he's, he's back squatted like 600 pounds, but his, his max deadlift is like in the low fives or something like that. So, um, yeah, whatever it's, uh, it helps with Olympic lifting. My, my anthropometrics helps with hitting heavy cleans. Um, like my, my clean one at max is 
only literally only like 70 pounds less than my deadlift one rep max. That's crazy. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, it's funny because when I looked at, when I was researching, I, it was the year they didn't name the workouts, right? It was yeah, test, right. Two, test, two, test. So all I see is a, is a weight number. And I'm like, how the hell did Casey not win a weightlifting event? Like I followed your career for years. Like you can lift some heavy weight. But now yeah. I know now it was, it's the Achilles heel of, of Casey. Absolutely. It is. It is the, I mean, as modestly as I could say this, I, I think that it is the one lift that I, I would probably not win relative to some of the other guys that have been in my division. Whereas I think if it were, you know, we, we, the next year we did a front squat one rep max. I won that. Um, in qualifiers, we've done back squat, four rep maxes, five rep maxes, um, we've done cleans, we've done snatches, and I've always been, if not for in first place, tied for first place. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just the one that uh, is not is not great for me. Yeah, uh, we all have those, and um, even someone who has won twenty two out of twenty three events at the CrossFit Games has one too. That's right. Um, so, so with that. I talked to you right after the event this year and you told me, I asked you about that record and you were, you told me that you had been preparing to compete before it was de developed as a competition. And so you came into this ahead of your competitors because a lot of people wait until it came to prepare and you prepared ahead of time. Can you walk us through that statement and what it means to you? Because I think I've talked to like Lana Marcin, who is in the, she's 75 and she's been begging for leaderboards for 65 to 79, 70 to 74, 75 to 79, just so people know it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Not that they want an, a spot in the games, just a leaderboard so that everybody knows it's a possibility. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, kind of that, I, I it's may, maybe it's a mindset that I have, all, like the only way that I can explain, you know, why I was doing that or why I was able to kind of reflect and see that I was doing that, um, is I've just always enjoyed going headfirst into things that are challenging to me. Um, and so at, at that stage in my life, um, I was in, I was in college. Um, I had, you know, I grew up as an athlete, so I had always been training, competing three sport athletes. So there's just never a time of year that I was like off. There was, it was just what I had done for years and years and years was stay in shape and train for a competition or train for a sport or the beginning of a season or whatever it might've been. Um, and so then after a couple years being in college doing, you know, I did some, the, the classic, um, you know, go do five K's. So I spent a, a year, um, you know, running a whole bunch. I have a little bit of a distance running background from high school. Um, so I, you know, I enjoyed doing that for a little bit. And then I had decided at a certain point that I wanted to put on some muscle. Um, so in my, my junior year of college, I spent, you know, a good six to eight months, just like basically like bulking, lifting really heavy, gained like 40 or 50 pounds in like six to eight months or something like that. Um, got all my strength numbers up pretty high and I had dabbled a little bit with CrossFit. Um, my, my high school athletic trainer, um, who kind of helped with some of our football weight room stuff during the summer. Uh, he was a CrossFit coach part-time. And so he introduced like the old John Wellborn CrossFit football training into our weight room. Um, and so I had a little bit of exposure prior but then it was, you know, January ish of 2013, um, me and my, my buddy who's now my, my business partner got started getting back into doing just like crossfit.com that for me pretty quickly progressed into doing like, um, like what's rich doing or following the comp train. Um, and I was in a, I was in a college rec center, right? So it wasn't really built out for CrossFit. So I was kind of just like teaching myself how to do all these things. And I would have to modify the workouts based on what equipment I had or didn't have. And the layout of the gym, like I would have to lift weights downstairs and then run upstairs to get to a rowing machine and just hope that some 
sorority girl hadn't taken my rowing machine by the time that I had gotten up there or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, like I just, it, it was something that instantly it was challenging for me. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. There were the second that I decided I was starting quote, quote, CrossFit, there was a laundry list of movements that based on my impairment, I could not do yet. And that like excited me because it gave me something else to start working on. Like up to that point, when it came to resistance training and working out, I had spent the first couple of years of college and that time period where I was kind of doing like the classic bodybuilding stuff, um, learning how to balance out my body. Like when I was in high school as an athlete, I kind of just accepted that I couldn't do things with my impaired limb and I just let it get like weak and small where my, my dominant arm was way bigger and stronger. Um, and I knew that if I ever wanted to gain muscle in my upper body, I needed to do it somewhat symmetrically. So I spent that first few years of really diving deep into training, trying to just work on the structural balance of my body and find ways to use um, to use my impaired side. And so that was when I came up with some of the strap uh, pieces of equipment that I use and stacking up plates so that I could do push-ups and, and just different things like that. So then whenever it came to CrossFit, it kind of expanded that list of now I'm not just thinking about what muscle groups I'm doing. I'm thinking about the actual functional movements and how I can try to mimic that stimulus for my body to be able to do them. Um, and then again, like I said, that, that very quickly progressed into, you know, I, I just jumped right into the following the CrossFit game stuff. And it was during Rich Froning's prime of, of being, um, you know, CrossFit games champ. It was his like third and fourth year that I was like really getting, getting into it. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I started following more like competitor style programming and figuring out how to do, um, you know, movements that at one point in my life, I, I thought would be impossible for me. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I had kind of the time it was, I, I studied exercise science, so it was an interesting kind of new world for me to look at that performance side of, of concurrent training and, and functional fitness and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've told this story a couple of times, but, um, Why you know, like, you sorry, go ahead. Yeah. There, there's a piece I want to follow up on and yeah. that is. You, you were doing these activities that with your, your one limb, you, you weren't working because you couldn't figure out how to fit it in or, or whatever. I'm going to be honest. Like I'm trying to dive into the adaptive division and learn it better. Yeah. But there are things yeah. that, that like blow my mind. I watched you clean and, and I've seen you do it with the strap a million times. Right. So, but then I saw you jerk. Yeah. And it, yeah. and it took me, it took my breath away. Like, because with your, with the, the limb that doesn't have the full arm on that side, you're clearing your head by like that much. Yeah. yeah. So how do you say I can do this without taking my scalp off? Is it just trial and error? Is it lower weights to f see what the distance, the clearance is? what what's the thought process that goes through your head in them in those moments yeah um you know like what i've always said is the most advanced things that i can do whether it be with a barbell gymnastics movements whatever it might be were all just a small jump from a previous slightly less complex thing that i had spent time mastering so i never did push presses until I knew that I could strict press a certain weight. So there, there was, a, there was a stage in my life that like in my high school weight room, I never did anything with a barbell with my upper body. I, I front squatted and I back squatted and that was it to work my chest and my shoulders. I used machines or I would just use a single dumbbell. So I, I never thought that it was possible to support a barbell on my arm until I tried it. And it's, it's just what you explained, right? It's, I stayed with basically no weight, figured out kind of what the balance needed to be, right? Cause I can't touch, I can't have my hand on the bar and my arm on the bar in the same spot. Like you would, if you had two hands, uh, you know, I'm slightly off to the side a little bit. And, and then I just developed strength of just a, a simple barbell strict press 
first. So I knew that at the bottom of that range of motion, I could support the barbell. And at the top of the range of motion, I could support the barbell on my limb. And, and over that, time, yeah, go ahead. And I'm sorry, I just have follow-ups as you're talking. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, okay. So you say the hand positioning is different to go yeah. overhead, but you have to clean the bar first. Right. So is your hand positioning and the strap different in the clean and then you have to adjust in the rack position before you go overhead. Yeah. Yeah. To a certain degree. And like, that's, you know, that process of like there, there was a time when I couldn't make that transition. Um, you know, developing the clean came from doing a workout and figuring out a strap that I did. I was doing sumo deadlift high poles and I started realizing like, Oh, I can get this bar up here if I could just shoot my elbows through, I might be able to catch it on my shoulders. So then that became, I, I learned how to master the clean. And then if, if workouts came up that were clean and jerk, I would do all the reps of clean. And then on my last clean, I would put the barbell on a rack and then put my arm underneath the bar to do the jerk reps. But then over time I, I started feeling that yes, if I, if I get the bar here, that then I can kind of pop the bar up with my shoulders, readjust my hand, get my arm underneath the bar to now go from a clean right into a jerk. So yet yeah, everything has just been like a, a process of mastering something less complex. And then gradually with, with tons and tons of reps and keeping the intensity low and making sure that the quality of movement is there as much as possible before I try to worry about like maximal expression, everything falls into that, which is a great principle for training overall. And I, I, I use myself as an example with one-on-one -on -one clients with athletes that to express things at the highest level, taking the time to build the widest base of support first is always going to allow for that maximal expression to be greater. And so, you know, people, I, I have a lot of times where adaptive athletes will message me and they want kind of my secrets for snatches and cleans and all these things. And I always make sure to remind them that I spent 12 years back squatting and front squatting and getting really, really strong on the base of those movements before I ever even did a clean. And so the reason that I can clean 345 pounds is not because I, not just because I found the magic recipe for the most efficient way for someone with one hand to be able to do it. It's also because I had a 405 pound back squat before I even tried doing a squat clean. Right. So, you know, that's, that's a huge part of the process for me. And then again, like, like I said, taking one movement, understanding how it can transfer and convert to another movement. So like snatches, that was one that even once I had gotten cleans and once I had gotten jerks, I hadn't figured out the snatch movement yet until I realized if the strap that I put on the bar is a little bit shorter then the, my, the proximity of my arm to the barbell, even in my pole is a little bit closer. So if I make this turnover, now where that bar is coming from is a lot tighter to my arm so I can now catch it overhead. But again, that, that never would have been there had I not figured out that I can do overhead squats first and support the bar at that kind of what, pers what's, what appears to be an extreme angle, but for me feels balanced, right? Because I spent the time doing overhead squats and, and, and more simple movements to make sure that the structural the stability was there before I added the intensity and the complexity of the snatch to it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's just been experimentation, building that foundation, um, being patient when I figure something out, not, not, not ever thinking that I'm like, that I've perfected it and knowing that I can always do just so something slightly more efficiently or, or, you know, stronger or whatever it might be. And always trying to find ways to advance a little bit to that next level. And again, I think that that comes from that desire to go into things that are challenging rather than shy away from them. And I just get a, a bunch of enjoyment out of it, even whenever it's an epic failure, 
um, I'll continue working on it, like doing things like handstand walks and, and that kind of stuff that I just haven't figured out yet. I still, every once in a while, spend a little time trying to work on it and see, see what I can do. I can't even imagine a handstand walk, but <laughs> the other movement that caught me off guard and that was the one armed rope climb. And then, it, and then as I watched you, I thought about it and I was like, well, I'm sure with all the pull-ups and all the upper body pulling he's done, like that, that one movement with the arm is okay. And once he pinches off with the feet, it's pretty basic. But until I saw you do it, like my, my head would, couldn't wrap around it until I actually watched a video of you doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, that, that's another one that there was a time in my life that I just, I, you know, maybe, maybe subconsciously, I just thought that I'm never going to have the grip strength to be able to support myself on a rope um, until I just, I, even though I had maybe that slight little bit of doubt in the back of my head, I didn't really allow for myself to accept that. And so I just continued working on it, working on it. And I mean, I, I would just spend time jumping and grabbing onto the rope as best as I could and holding on for as long as I could till over time I was able to hold on long enough to get my leg wrapped around the rope to support myself and kind of shimmy my way up slowly. Um, and then, and then, yeah, over time I've gotten stronger and stronger in that position, right? Not like as far as adaptive athletes go upper extremity specifically, I consider myself lucky because of how much use I still get out of my impaired limb. So I even use my other arm, this arm, I, cr I create almost like a clamp, I guess you could say, where I'm, I'm gripping and this is kind of like my primary upper body support, but I also put my left arm kind of on top of my hand and it, it not, it tightens my grip on the rope. And it also allows for me to pull with my left side of my body a little bit so that I'm not, I'm not just free one handed pulling. I'm able to kind of use both. Um, and I just, over time I've gotten really good at, you know, sitting back really far and getting my feet really, really high on the rope to take advantage of as much of the squatting of the rope climb as I can, um, to make it again, as efficient as possible because I can't reach as high on the rope as some people can, but if I can jump really high to get started and bring my feet up really high so that each time I'm pulling, I'm kind of making up that ground a little bit, you know, to me, I was able to kind of tighten up how close I am to say like an able body field in a, in a rope climb to, to a certain extent. And and that was my follow-up is one thing I noticed is the hand, the arm without the hand yeah. did come up the rope and now mm -hmm. it makes, it actually sits on top of the hand. So you can use the lats and you can use everything to pull yourself up. Yeah. Man, it's, it's so, it's cool. It's almost like a puzzle of how to figure <laughs> it out. Right? Yes. Um, but, but it goes back to what we we're talking about. You've been preparing for this for 12 years, right? You said 12 years of back squatting, 12 years of front squatting, building that base. And then you have an adaptive athlete reach out to you and say, what's your secret? And you can't give that to them in six months. Correct. Right. Because, because you, you were training like this was going to happen 10 years before it happened. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And, and, you know, I'm, again, I'm just, call it lucky, call it blessed, whatever, whatever you want to go with. Um, even just my athletic background before I even knew what CrossFit was, I was the, I was an odd combination of a skill, a, a skill player in football, being a wide receiver and a defensive back, uh, playing basketball, and then also being a middle distance runner, being a, a mile, a, 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 you know, 1600 meter and 3200 meter runner in high school. So I had a, like a nice combination of a little bit of strength training, power training, speed, sprint stuff in football, basketball, which you would consider to be kind of like, you know, more of like the lactate threshold energy system. Um, and, and I also was lucky enough to have a coach that, uh, you know, we, we ran sprints like crazy and we were a team that just did basically did like full court press, nonstop the entire game. So it was just, it was just running basically. Um, and, and then being a distance runner. So in addition to 
some of the other things, just as far as training in the gym, the foundation that I had energy, energy system wise, and kind of athletically before I even started to really focus on the training side of, of things, I think has been helpful for me where, you know, whenever a run comes up in a competition, you know, I can, I can train running and get really good at it in a really short amount of time because I have that great base of support for it. And then, you know, being a multi-sport athlete, doing some of the more athletic things, box jump overs and, and just, you know, the weird random things that we might do in competition. And even just, even just things that are new that no one has trained people that have a, a diverse athletic background, in my opinion, both as a coach and an athlete are usually able to adapt to those new odd things even quicker. You can easily, more easily find the most efficient way to perform something when you've got this diverse athletic background where you kind of grew up doing that anyways. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I consider myself very blessed to have kind of found CrossFit at the right time and be, be a part of it at the right time. Um, and have the, the background that I have, that I had coming into it. Um, it's, it's, again, I think that I've, it's been kind of a good combination of things for me. And that's probably why I've, um, been able to excel in, in competition. So it's a perfect segue into your coaching career. You went to school to, for exercise science. So I think in your mind, you were always wanting to be a coach at some point. Yeah. You, you get into this CrossFit space, you own a gym. So I'm assuming you coach classes, you coach one-on-one, -on -one, correct? Um, yeah. So my, my gym is like a, actually it's like a fully, I, I have coached at a CrossFit gym before. Um, my gym is, uh, like an OPEX model. Um, so it's, it's all individualized as well as we do some small group for, like middle school, high school, college athletes. Um, so primarily in my gym is, is like one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, I, we call it kind of small group, but it's all, it's all individually based, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I was the head coach and manager of a CrossFit gym for, for three years before I, before I started this. Um, so I've done a fair amount of group training and I coach, I coach high school football as well. So yes, I've, uh, you're right. I, I've always known that I wanted to be in this, some sort of like coaching position. So I have to ask you this. I have a, a listener who has been begging me to have you on. Oh, yeah. She's a huge fan, Elise Carradal. Yeah. She just showed up late 30 minutes to this interview. <laughs> As a coach, uh, and I'll put that up. Forgive me for being late, been waiting so long for this interview. Uh, sad faces. Do you make her do burpees or do you forgive her and just let her join the class? Well, I first would ask if there's a good reason why she's late and I'm sure there is. So I'll be, I'll be, I'll forgive her for being late. Uh, and, and to be honest, that's one of the benefits of the individual design model of coaching uh, is that you don't have to wait for a class and the class doesn't have to wait for anybody uh, we, we were lucky to enough to have basically like an open gym schedule. So our clients get to kind of come and go as they please. So at least, at least you might, uh, you might enjoy our gym space if you were ever in Decatur, Illinois. Well, I know she lives in Indiana, so it's not that far away. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Not far at all. Um, but back to coaching, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we talk about you developing these skills over time and figuring out the puzzle pieces. <laughs> is that a natural fit for being a coach? Yeah, I think so. Um, because like when you whittle all the, all the different methodologies, you know, CrossFit and functional movements and high intensity and, and low intensity aerobics, whatever, all the different things that can go into, we'll say coaching or program design or whatever you want to call it. Um, it all boils down to principles and what your, what your core principles are. And so, you know, that's, that's always been something I, that I've been big on is like understanding what my principles are and using that to guide the methods. And so, you know, the things that I've learned from kind of using myself as an athlete, as an experiment is these fat, these foundational base of support things 
Um, and of course, kind of the, the CrossFit methodology of mechanics, consistency, then intensity, even for the athletes at the highest level. A lot of times whenever I start working with, you know, a, a CrossFit competitor, kind of the most important job that I, that I do there is force them to kind of take a step back. Right. And I, I've, I've really found that what a lot of CrossFit athletes that want to get better at competition need is not so much like so these advanced high level methods of training. It's more, it's actually reverse. It's like go back and, and then that's going to help us go further forward. Most of the time athletes, when they're looking for a coach, a one-on-one -on -one coach, they've probably reached a point where they're not improving by continuing to do all the same things that got them to where they are now. And usually what that means is that you have to kind of go back to the roots and the foundation of who they are as an athlete to rebuild some of those, those, you know, foundational things to then come back to the higher level of expression to be able to move past those plateaus. Um, and so for me, that's, you know, I, I think I've probably said it like 25 times that, for me, the most important things that I've done to be able to do fitness at a high level and, um, you know, display skills and movement patterns and, you know, barbell lifts that are very, very advanced has been to first have the foundational base of support to be able to do those on. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that that my kind of my background and my development as an athlete, I, I say it all the time that even, even if I weren't able to compete, I, I still say that I would probably be training as an athlete in some capacity because I've been able to use myself as an experiment to then, you know, take those, the training methodologies that I've, that I've used on myself and apply them to my clients and, and to athletes. And so, um, yeah, I think that probably some of the things that I've learned by trying to figure these things out on my own has been a perfect kind of um, learning experience for me to better serve my my clients for sure. So this that's a perfect segue too, is at this point in your career, you are you are pretty dominant in your division, right? And not to say that winning ever gets old right? <laughs> it, it, I'm not trying to imply that at all, but I saw you in, or in Orlando where you were coaching a semifinal athlete. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're with underdogs and you're, and you're bringing more people on in your little stable of athletes. Mm -hmm. What is more rewarding for you at this point in your career, seeing your athletes succeed or succeeding yourself? Seeing my athletes succeed 100%. Um, I mean, I, 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 abs I enjoy competing. Um, I, I probably actually enjoy the training side of preparing for competition more than I enjoy the competition itself. Um, but 100% what, what my passion is from a professional standpoint is helping athletes achieve their goals. And so that, that to me, um, you know, I, I kind of almost look at it as like, I I've gotten my, spotlight, right? I've gotten my due of, of getting to do competitions. And, and I've always been very much under the, the mindset of like, whatever it is, if, if it's an opportunity for me, I'm going to take it, I'm going to go do it, I'm going to try to win it. Because my my mindset is if I'm going to do anything at all, I'm going to do it the best I possibly can. Um, but, you know, I almost kind of still I perceive myself to almost be kind of this like, washed up athlete where that, even though I'm still an athlete and I'm still training at a high level and competing at a high level and it, and it is a priority to me, it's definitely down on the list of priorities compared to some of the other things in my life. And that's, that's I'll, behind I'll coaching. Give you, I'll give you priorities. I won't give you washed up. Well, thanks. I, I appreciate that. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just a persona that I've taken on to, continue to remind myself to not take myself too seriously from an athlete side of things. Um, I, I, I look at those as like, just, they're just things that I get to do. Right. It's, it's just, I I'm, I'm lucky again, like I said, to be involved with this stuff at the right time, both, um, you know, physically 
in, in my life, in my career, I'm at a place where, um, you know, it's very easy for me to shut my computer off for an hour and walk three steps and boom, I'm in my gym and I, I can get a training session in very efficiently. Um, and again, my career has allowed for my schedule to be very flexible with, with a lot of my clientele being online. Um, that, yeah, I mean, I'm able to spend a good amount of time training and, and being a quote, quote athlete, but you know, like if something had to go, that would be one of the first things that would have to go. Um, because again, it's, it's not, it's not number one on my list of priorities. It's, it's pretty far down there. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a coach and a husband and a father and a business owner. And I, like I said, I'm a high school football coach. And so that's something that's very important to me. Um, and so there's a lot of other things that from an energy um, and awareness and focus standpoint are more important to me than, um, than being an athlete. And so those are the things that, that really fulfill me and kind of fill my cup up, if you will. Um, whereas like being an athlete is kind of just a bonus on top of those things. And everything else has kind of been set up in a way that I'm still allowed to do that. Um, but yeah, like I said, if, if there were something that had to go, that would be one of the first that would probably come up. I didn't even know you were doing football coaching. <laughs> yeah, it's um, all it's it's it's. I tell people this: the first the first official practice of the season is always the Monday after the games conclude. So it's a pretty short transition period between coming off that exhausting week of of travel and and competing. And um, you know, if I'm if I'm being totally honest, I'm usually socially also kind of at my at my end. Right. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a loner at times of my day and my life. And so that forces me to be very, very social for long periods of the day. And so, yeah, I, I get a couple days of rest and then, yeah, first football practice is, is the Monday right after, right after the games. It was nice this year that they went back to the 2021 schedule where I was done on Thursday competing, came home on Friday and still had the weekend to kind of get my life back together. Um, Last season, 2022, week the adaptives and age groups competed Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So then it was travel home Sunday, and then football practice started that very next day. So that was a challenge. I was definitely not um, probably, I hate to say it, probably my highest energy and emotional level on that first couple of days of football practice uh, last year. So this year was actually kind of nice having at least a couple of days to kind of get my life together. Yeah. It's, it's good to know that there are good dudes like you doing football coaching. I just started the documentary on HBO about BS high. Yeah. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. Uh, and, and it happened right here in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Uh, which is why I dove into it. <laughs> but what that, what that guy pulled was so criminal uh, to the youth of our country. Yeah. Uh, he should be locked up for a long time. Yeah, it's just the 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 good. Well, I guess I know they they ended up actually playing more games than just the one that got aired, right? Well, they played for two years leading up to that game. Right, right. So at Once least that game, it, uh, then that it got shut down. Right. God. Yes. At least mm -hmm. the the one that got the greatest exposure, IMG Academy, just like absolutely destroyed them. So at least the the one that they got a bunch of attention for was like, Oh, and also they got embarrassed by a high school that was actually a high school. <laughs> I guess you can kind of consider right. IMG well, a high school. But they, didn't, they didn't have trainers. They didn't right. have medical staff and yeah. the kids were really hurt left and right in that game because they yeah. were not prepared to play an IMG Academy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and how he duped all those families into trusting him to taking care of their kids. Yeah. Well, when people think they've got an opportunity to go D1 or get a scholarship or go pro, yeah, you kind of will. Um, Those were all the promises. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All the promises. I, yeah, I, I coach high school at a very, very, so it's, I actually coach at the same high school that I graduated from, which is, a, you know, a big part of it for me is that I'm kind of like, you know, giving back a little bit to the community. 
Um, and it's a super small school. I mean, we're, we're with actually two schools combined for our football team, um, you know, around 300 for the total enrollment of the two schools combined. So we're, we're very small Ironman football. Everybody plays both sides of the ball. Um, you know, a bunch of, bunch of country kids. Um, but I, I, I definitely really enjoy it. And, and, and it's, again, it's just something that's, I, I get to do to kind of fill my cup and, and also, um, you know, fulfill my purpose of being a coach in the grand scheme of things. Um, I just need to let you know that Elise does have family indicators. So no way. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Decatur's is Decatur's a small. <laughs> yeah. She, she's more than welcome. Uh, Decatur's I, I call it the smallest big town in the, in the country. It's fairly large, but like if you're from Decatur, you kind of know, everybody from Decatur or you're related to somebody else from Decatur who's related to somebody else. So I don't know, Lisa and I might even be related. Never know. My, uh, my only recollection of Decatur is I'm a Chicago bears fan. Yeah. And that's where we, that's where they started. started. Yep. That's right. The yep. Decatur Staley's back in 1920. That's right. Uh, and that's, that's what I know of Decatur. <laughs> well, I w- it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't bring out this up, but I had, Mikey Wittis with me uh, last week or the week before. Yeah. I'm um, talking about the adaptive divisions at the CrossFit Games. Mm-hmm. And the way I'm going to present this, and you can say as much as you want or as little as you want. On Wednesday night at the CrossFit Games, I was at a press conference where Don Fall stood up and said that the adaptive divisions are the most inspira- inspirational group of humans here at the CrossFit Games. The next night, people like Mikey didn't even get championship t-shirts. Yeah. Which was appalling to me. In addition, yeah. Yeah. there are rumors that the age groups and adaptives are going to be broke off from the main CrossFit games and have their own thing. Mm-hmm. If you are so inclined, what are your thoughts around that stuff that happened at the games? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, first off, um, I kind of, I have kind of dual opinion about this because I, like I've said, I come from an era where there was kind of nothing. And I was, I was training like an athlete and doing all a lot of really hard work, even though there wasn't really anything for me to do from a competition standpoint. So I kind of have this side of me. That's just, I mean, I'm, I'm really like whatever opportunities I get, I try to be very thankful for, um, and in the time that I've been involved with, with CrossFit competition, those opportunities for adaptives have really grown quite a bit. Would it, would it be great if there was more growth and, and more opportunities and more attention, more money, more sponsorship opportunities? Yes, absolutely. And so I'm, I'm also on that side of the argument of like, yes, Don Fall is right. A lot of people that are watching – probably relate more to myself and Mikey and the neuro athletes and the seated athletes, right? There's a huge population of people who could really, really benefit from the CrossFit training methodology that relate more to those stories than they do to the, you know, Jeff Adler's of the world or the Brent Fakowski's or Vellner's or whatever. Right. Um, so, you know, I think it's obvious that they're, they're maybe kind of missing out on some opportunities to share those stories to help grow CrossFit for all people. Um, and yeah, I mean, as far as like the, the competition opportunities um, and, and yeah, just like little things like that, that, you know, get, getting shirts available for all of the division athletes that they invite to come to Madison, that the only, the only thing they're going to have them do is walk out on the floor for their podium ceremony. Um, to not, yeah, to not have shirts for them is just like, it's maybe it's not egregious, but it is negligent in my opinion. Um, and so, you know, things like that, that maybe, maybe in the grand scheme of things, and, and Mikey would probably be the first to tell you, it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, but it's also a really bad look. And so if they're going to, if they're saying on, and on one hand and in one discussion, 
that they 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 really value the adaptive divisions and they think it's super inspirational and they think it's really important for them to have the adaptives there but then they don't treat the adaptive divisions the same way that some of the other divisions are treated you're kind of telling two stories at once and you know it's it's the same thing with the the live stream the adaptive and age group live stream which has just been of course a huge point of conversation because of just how it was unwatchable like you it, to be totally honest they would have probably just been better off a week before the games announcing that there wasn't going to be live coverage of the adaptive and age groups but that they're going to have film teams on the on the fields or on the on the floor to produce some content post event just be straightforward and clear about it so that you're not putting on this front as if, yeah, we're live streaming everything just like we always have. And then that's what you put up and then you have to answer to it later. And I feel like that, that's not the only case where CrossFit tends as CrossFit headquarters and the, the sport department, they tend to have kind of this, this thing where they like to be very secretive and they don't, they're not usually very, open and clear about what the expectations should be for athletes, for spectators, for coaches, for whatever it might be until the very last minute. And then they kind of have to explain themselves later. And it's like, you would be much better off if you would just be straightforward about it at the beginning, instead of having to try to answer to it later. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, as far as the the rumors about the um, you know the adaptive divisions and age groups being split off and being kind of their own separate event, um, I, I have mixed feelings about that. Uh, on the one hand, you may kind of lose the spectacle, you may lose the attention, you may lose the sponsorship opportunities, the exposure, whatever else that might come with the adaptives being on site with the elite athletes. On the other hand you may have a better quality event for the athletes because it won't be kind of a side piece that's going on that ever that's being worked around the main event. And, and look, I get it. The, the elite athletes that's for, for CrossFit, that's what pays the bills. Um, as far as, you know, making their, their money for the CrossFit games. And it is a business when it comes down to it. So I understand that, that in the grand scheme of things, we are kind of a, a side show. I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but we're kind of a side show to that main event. So I get that. And so maybe, maybe it will be a better opportunity for adaptive athletes. So I encourage all adaptive athletes to look at that as a potential positive where CrossFit will still be sanctioning this event. They'll still run the open. So the the worldwide exposure that CrossFit having the adaptive divisions has allowed could still be there. And there's been tons of growth that's come from CrossFit, including the adaptive divisions. And then the actual in-person event that happens, we may be allowed to have more athletes. It might be 10 per division. They might be able to split the divisions into the more refined classes that competitions like wheel Watt are already doing. Um, Hopefully that will mean that all the divisions will get to compete in person instead of, you know, uh, five of the divisions being just an online portion. So there's going to be some, if that is the case, there can definitely be some positives that come from that. So I try to look at everything very optimistically. And again, I'm going to continue taking whatever opportunities I can get to compete um, I feel that not only is that what I should do because I should take advantage of the time that I can still do it, but I also feel a responsibility to that to continue trying to lift the sport in any way that I can. And for me, what that's been so far is being the best athlete that I can possibly be and showing up on game day and being a good story that CrossFit and other parties can hopefully share to help everything else to grow. I think Gosh, you said so much there that I, and I have so many reactions to it. <laughs> but the one thing I want to ask you is you say that CrossFit looks at you guys as a sideshow. I, I ask the question, are you really the sideshow or are you just being treated like the sideshow? 
because I was there all week this year. There were more people in the Coliseum for adaptives and age groups than there were for teams. There were 60,000 people on a stream you couldn't see hoping to see in adaptives and age groups. What could that number have been if it was clear? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm with you. It's, I, it's kind of a hard question to answer. Um, it's a very chicken and the egg, right? Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. Because you're being treated like the sideshow or are you truly like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And again, like, and, um, you know, there were, there were several, there were several people that I've listened to on podcasts and, and whatever else that have made kind of the same argument that, you know, for, first off, maybe maybe CrossFit needs to really look deep and decide what their core values are and what they're trying to do. Are they, um, you know, are they trying to grow the affiliates? Are they trying to run a really good business? Are they trying to run a really good competition? And so for them, um, you know, getting are, – are they trying to get more people in the doors of affiliates? And if, if that's one of their core values, then highlighting the people – that the vast majority of people that need that need physical training relate to would be probably beneficial. And that's probably more of the age groups and the adaptive athletes and the people that um, it's not easy for them to go into a gym and get really, really fit and look good and look cool and express fitness at a high level, right? Those, those people are already doing it. They don't, they don't have to inspire they don't really have to inspire the next CrossFit games champion to, to go into a CrossFit gym, to be a CrossFit games champion, because that's going to happen organically for that person, right? The, the cream's always going to rise to the top. The sport's going to self-select for the people that are going to be the top of the top. The people that are going to be inspired are the people that are, are the, you know, the pre-diabetic that could lose 40 pounds and as a professional and has kids and, and needs, needs physical fitness to live a, a larger and, and more, um, more vital life. Probably not the person that's going to be the future CrossFit games champion. Those people are, are going to find their way there on their own. If, if you ask me, that's, that's my opinion. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, to, to answer the question of, is it the sideshow or is it just being treated like the sideshow? I don't know. And, and look, my CrossFit games experience for all three years, as far as our, the, the organization, the quality of the events, the quality of the judging, um, all those things has been, has been top notch. And so it's, it's not like we're not getting a good experience when we're there, but there are still five divisions that have never got gotten to compete on site at the CrossFit games. And there's, there's, there's things like what we mentioned with, with Mikey and the, the divisions that they invite to come and just participate in the podium ceremony, not getting a championship shirt. I mean, damn noble. How many, how many shirts do you think noble printed for athletes over the course of the weekend? And there were, there were maybe 20 athletes in attendance that were, coming from the online divisions, the adaptive divisions, they couldn't come up with 20 more shirts. Um, you know, it's like a simple thing that, that again, like they have to kind of answer to later because it's something that's not being really like clear and, and they're, they're not being clear and open about in the, in the initial stages of it. So, yeah. I'll leave this, this whole debate with this statement at another press conference, Don Fall said, we make money in the open and we make money at the games. It's the stuff in between that we don't. And that's yeah. what we have to fix. So why are you tweaking what's happening at the games? If that's not where you're losing money and you're not, you, the adaptive and age group divisions aren't costing them anything between the open and the games because it's all online. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a good observation. Um, right. Yeah, it's interesting. All right, so we'll leave that all together. And this For has sure. gone way longer than I anticipated. <laughs> Sorry, I, I talk not, a lot. I have not even got through half of my notes. Um, I'm going to leave on a happy note. And that is, uh, I'm going to share my screen here real quick. You are 
first and foremost, a husband and a father. Yeah. And so I want to put that. Uh, up. Yeah. That's my crew there. So a boy and a girl. Yeah. And Paxton is your wife. Yes. Yeah. Um, what does she mean to you in, in your pursuit of your career, whether it be athlete or coach? Oh, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> I'm a big softy. Um, I mean, yeah, for me, those three right there, that's, that's when it all comes down to it, whether it's, it's my career and me pursuing things that are, that I'm passionate about. Um, it's, it's all so that I can give them the best version of myself. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's my opinion that, um, they're for, for, at least for me personally, I need to be doing something that I'm passionate about. And sometimes in, in our, in, in mine and Paxton's marriage, um, it's, it's put strain on us from a time standpoint, from an energy standpoint, from a financial standpoint. Um, but she's always been able to kind of see the deeper purpose for me and, and been willing to, um, you know, take on, take on things for me so that I could put the time and energy into the things that I'm passionate about. Um, no, no matter what that meant for us. And, uh, she, she knew she, she's known that me being able to do the things that I'm passionate about and, and that, um, again, you know, that, that fill my cup up are always going to come back to me being able to be the best father, the best husband, um, and be the, you know, present whenever I'm home with them and have good energy, um, to, to give to my kids, which they require a lot of energy. Those two, those two right there are, Two of the craziest, most energetic, most all over the place children ever. Um, and so, you know, and I, I, I love getting to go home to them every single day and, um, you know, see the things that they've been, that they've been doing and learning and watching them grow and develop. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, she has been uh, a huge support for me to be able to go and do all these, all these crazy things and, and, uh, you know, be an athlete and travel for, for coaching. Um, and she just is a rock, you know, there's no, there's no better word for it. She's a rock that just holds down our fort and, oh, she's the best mom in the world. Really. Um, our kids absolutely love her and like, <laughs> I'm stupid when it comes to things like that. And she just, for whatever reason has always known what to do. And so I always just get to fall back on, on her and what she knows to be right for our kids and for our family. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would not be, I would not have my own business. I would probably not be a three-time CrossFit games champion, uh, if it, if it weren't for her being that, that support at home. So, yeah, she's uh, her. Her and those those two kids there. They're they're everything to me. Do Do I remember correctly that I saw her at the finish line? Yeah, games. Yeah. So what does that mean when you're coming down? You know you're going to win the games. You're finishing that last event, and you see her at the end of the at the end of the lane. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's awesome. Um, you know, there's again, the, the, the CrossFit games are not a career for me. There's not enough money in it for it to be something that I'm able to do to, to, you know, bring a bunch of money home to our family. Um, but you know what I, the way that I look at it is there it's, it's stories, it's examples that I'm going to be able to share with my kids to tell them, I know how much hard work can pay off for them, no matter what it is that they're doing. And I have this, this, real life example of what that looks like. And I have these things that I can show them these, these images, these videos of them being, um, you know, young and me getting to do these things. And so, um, you know, one of the first things that I do whenever I walk out on the floor for an event is look up and, and, uh, find them because it just, it reminds me why I'm there, right. It's easy to get caught up in the, the points and, the events and the standards and the judging and all these things that, you know, 10, 20 years from now, never going to remember, not going to matter at all. 
Um, but the experiences that I, that I get to share with them and the places that I get to take them and the things that I'm learning by being an athlete that I'm going to get to share with them mean so much more. And so, um, yeah, I always, I always go out and I find them and my son is usually, uh, he's yelling like, go Casey Acre. He uses my full name. He, he like, cause everybody else around him is like, let's go Casey, let's go Casey. And so he's, he's screaming, let's go Casey. Uh, and yeah, I mean, so I, I find them and just give them a big smile and a wave. And it helps me to just kind of remember that it's, 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 it's a game when it comes down to it. it it's fun. Um, it, it's serious to an extent, but it's also, it's just a small part of a, a much bigger purpose um, and, and, and much bigger meaning in, in my life. So yeah, getting to finish and, and then be right there um, is, is pretty fun. This year, my son, he was, it was really, really loud in there. Um, and so he was actually like screaming because it was like getting so loud around him when I was coming. He was like crying a little bit because uh, he, he got a little bit scared. And my daughter was just like, had no idea what was going on. But um, yeah, it was cool. Like finishing that event, it just being like a, a straight forward. Like I'm doing, I'm doing dumbbell squat snatches and I'm like looking my wife basically directly in the eye essentially. Cause she's like right down the lane. So yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. Well, just know, um, I became a big softie when I became a girl dad 22 years ago. So <laughs> um, now I cry at the drop of a hat. Yeah. Uh, you know, good movie makes me blubber like an idiot. So yeah. Um, things are different when you, when you become a dad, right? They it, just oh. Are. You can ask my wife. I, I am like, it's, it's the silliest little thing. Like I'll see my daughter do something that I didn't know she could do. And it'll like make me cry. Cause I'm like proud that she, I'm like proud that she figured out how to climb up onto our kitchen table, even though I know she's not supposed to be doing that. I'm like, damn, that's, that's pretty cool. And it'll like make me cry. Cause I'm just like so proud of, of them every single day, like everything that they do. So yeah, I, I don't worry. I'm the, I am also the biggest softie in the world. Yeah. Um, Elise will finish with this. Elise says, uh, she's blessed to have you two going off how you speak of her. And then she says to me, uh, don't blame your daughter, Scott. <laughs> um, well, Casey, again, I didn't get through hardly any of the notes at all. Um, it was just fun kind of like chilling out and chatting with you. Yeah. As we know more going into this off season, I got to have you back. I'd love to. Some of this stuff. Um, but we'll let you go for today. Uh, I went over. I usually, I usually do not. Tr I try not to go over an hour. We've gone over an hour today. It's my um, fault. I get I get going on tangents and got all these ideas and words. And so don't worry. It's not your fault. No, I had a lot of follow-up questions. Um, <laughs> and I'm glad you answered them. And it was really interesting getting to know more about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have made an, uh, a promise this year to get to know more about the adaptive divisions, get to know more about the age group divisions. Yeah. give them yeah. the support that they deserve. And so we're going to do that throughout this year. And I want to thank you so much for being here. Elise, you heard that. We're going to have them back. Don't be late next time. <laughs> With that, we will catch everybody next time on the Clydesdale Media Podcast. <laughs>